All right, well, let's open our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. This morning, we're going to be looking at verses 29 through 31. So Hebrews 11, 29 through 31. The, the doctrine of God's judgment, in some ways, has fallen upon hard times. Uh, people tend to like the idea of a God of love. Uh, people like the idea of a God who forgives. People like the idea of a God who is gracious and a God who is merciful. Uh, people like the idea that God has a sense of humor. People generally do not like the idea that uh, there is a holy God who is just and who is righteously angry with sinners. And uh, if we want people to embrace the Christian message, which we do, uh, we might be tempted to leave out parts of the Bible that underscore God's judgment. Uh, we might be tempted to sort of amend the, the Christian message in order to make it more palatable to people within the context of our culture. And yet, uh, one thing that we're going to see in our text for this morning is that it's actually not possible to present the, the truth of God without conveying the idea that God is just and that uh, God cares deeply about bringing justice against sin. So uh, look with me at Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 29. It says, By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. So those are the uh, three examples we're going to look at this morning. Uh, it says that the faith of the people of Israel, uh, or that it was by faith that the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea as on dry ground. And so in order for the people to escape from uh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians, it required faith, right? It required them to believe that uh, God would do what he said he would do when he promised to bring them into the promised land. It required them to believe that God was at work in their lives, delivering them from bondage and guiding them through Moses, which involved that God was actually speaking through Moses, and it required them to ignore the threat of stepping out uh, onto the seabed between the chaotic waters of the Red Sea and uh, trusting that the Lord would continue to hold back those waters and that he wouldn't uh, allow the waters to collapse upon them. And so the, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry ground by faith, right? It required faith. And, and yet the Egyptians... When they, tempted, when they attempted to do the same thing, they were drowned, the text says. Now, it might seem obvious or intuitive um, because, you know, this is just one more act of judgment in a series of judgments that the Lord has brought against Egypt. But if the Israelites passed through by faith, if it was faith in their hearts that enabled them to pass through, then what was it in the hearts of the Egyptians that they were not able to pass through, but instead fell under God's judgment? And uh, we actually don't have to speculate about this, because in uh, Exodus 14, we see exactly what it was that led to Pharaoh's destruction. So in Exodus uh, 14 and verse 4, the Lord tells Moses, he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue you, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh. And then in uh, Exodus 14, verse 5, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people of Israel, and they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? And so uh, Pharaoh, he leads out the army and pursues them. And when they begin to draw near to the people of Israel, the Lord again comes to Moses and tells Moses, he says, uh, tell the people of Israel to go forward, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. 
And, and so although the Israelites were uh, moved forward by faith, it was a, a hardness of heart in the Egyptians that um, was compelling them. And so it was pride, it was arrogance, it was remaining willfully blind to God's greatness and God's power that had uh, resulted in this, this final destruction of Egypt in this episode. And, and there's really sort of a word of caution in this because, you know, let's say you have a, a certain perspective on something. And, uh, and, and your perspective on that, whatever that thing is, your perspective is wrong, right? So you're embracing some sort of false narrative, but then you are confronted with a, a series of things and those things provide overwhelming evidence that your narrative is false. But uh, rather than uh, adjusting your belief system and uh, facing the overwhelming evidence, uh, you stubbornly maintain your commitment to the false narrative, right? And, and that's exactly what Pharaoh is doing here, right? He had this narrative that his authority couldn't be challenged, right? That he was uh, in a place of absolute authority. He had this narrative that, you know, within that context, that actually the theology was that Pharaoh himself was a god. So he believed that he was a god and that there were uh, these other gods of Egypt that looked favorably upon him and uh, that the Israelites and their god were weak. Uh, that was his narrative. But then God brought all of these plagues upon Egypt. And uh, of course that undermined, or theoretically, you would think that that would undermine uh, Pharaoh's narrative. Uh, but rather than abandoning the narrative, Pharaoh kept doubling down. And uh, uh, rather than adjusting his belief and uh, humbling himself before the Lord, he exalted himself and convinced himself that he actually had the capacity to come against God's people and to emerge victorious over the God of Israel, right? And so the thing about that is that's the nature of unbelief. Right? That's what unbelief does. Uh, the book of Romans talks about how we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And uh, Paul details how uh, God's invisible attributes have been clearly seen in the things that have been made. And how although uh, all men know that God is there, they don't honor him as God or give thanks. And, and what that means is that it's our tendency to embrace and to maintain a false narrative uh, in spite of the evidence. And when we're confronted with evidence to the contrary of our narrative, rather than abandoning the narrative, we dismiss the evidence, we attack the source of the evidence, or we create some sort of justification so that we can explain how the evidence supposedly fits into our false narrative. And, and so you can imagine you have a, a, a woman Okay, and uh, let's say that this woman likes to shop, which I know it's not particularly difficult to imagine, but you have a woman, uh, she likes to shop, and uh, she often, uh, in this case, she often overspends. And so she finds herself in debt, she finds herself having trouble paying her bills, uh, but rather than accepting her financial difficulties as evidence that she needs to curb her spending habits, she blames the fact that her, her employer doesn't pay her enough. Uh, she blames the fact that the credit card company uh, gives her too much, uh, too high a credit limit or charges too much interest. And, uh, and maybe, or maybe she simply ignores the credit card bills and simply lives in denial of the fact that there's a problem, right? There are all different kinds of ways of suppressing the truth. But um, that's one example. Another example, maybe you have a guy who professes to be a believer, uh, but he is not connected to a local church. Uh, he doesn't see the value of the local church, and he actually believes that uh, being part of a local church isn't necessary in the Christian life. Although he would say that the Bible is the authority and um, those kinds of things. So, uh, 
he has this, this false narrative about the importance of the local church. And when he is confronted with the overwhelming evidence in scripture that it is necessary for Christians to be part of a local church, he continues to uphold the false narrative, right? He tells himself that uh, the reason that he's not connected to a church maybe is because he's been uh, burned by churches in the past. And uh, rather than confronting his fears and seeking to do what the Bible calls Christians to do within the context of the local church, he can convinces himself that those passages of scripture don't apply in his particular situation because the, the, the so-called churches are full of hypocrites, right? And they don't teach the truth. They don't really follow Jesus. And so he justifies his own uh, false narrative in that way. And, and we can look at countless other examples, but we need to be careful that we don't fall into those kinds of traps. Uh, that we are uh, open to the idea that the narratives that we're embracing could be false. And this is actually where uh, fellow believers can be a help to us, right? Because uh, I can see your sins more clearly than you can, even as you can see my sins more clearly than I can for this reason, right? Self-deception is a, a real thing. And so we need to um, love the truth what it comes down to. We need to love the truth more than we love comfort and convenience and, and sin, right? Because it's the love of comfort and convenience and sin that leads us to embrace these false narratives in the first place. And so for, for those who harden their hearts and rebel against what the Lord is calling them to do because they're unwilling to abandon these false narratives, uh, it's going to end for them in the same way that it ended for the Egyptians. So uh, don't do that. Um, continuing in verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. So uh, after the people left Egypt and after their time in the wilderness, as they prepared to enter into the promised land, they uh, came to the city of Jericho. And uh, Jericho was a fortified city. It was a city with walls. And so how can these poorly equipped people who have been wandering for 40 years in the wilderness come up against a fortified city. And uh, the way that the Lord tells them to do it is that they are for uh, six days, they are to march around the city. Uh, the fighting men are going to be followed by seven priests with seven trumpets. Uh, the priests are going to be followed by the Ark of the Covenant and the rear guard. And this entire caravan is to march around the, the city uh, once per day for a series of six days. And then on the, the seventh day, uh, they're to march around the city seven times. Then they're to give a long blast on the trumpets, at, which will be the signal for everybody to shout. And at that point, the walls of Jericho will come down. So, so that's the plan. And um, the way that God wants them to go about it is obviously a little bit strange or odd in the sense that it, you know, from an earthly perspective, it doesn't align with any like military strategy that you would typically employ if you're going to come against a city like this. Uh, but the point is that the people trust the Lord, right? They, they believe in God. They believe in his promises. They, they've, they've seen how the Lord has intervened miraculously in their lives. And so the people are prepared to do what Joshua told them to do, even though the specifics might have seemed strange or even counterproductive. And, you know, I think we see that in our own lives. There, there are times when, you know, you think about, um, uh, you know, someone who perhaps is seeking a divorce and they're, they're in a difficult marriage and, you, the, you know, according to what God's word says, they don't have biblical grounds for divorce and yet they can't see any way that they can continue in the marriage with this person because of the emotions and the difficulty and the conflict and all of that, right? And so the Bible says something clearly, but, you know, we in our own fallen humanity, uh, we question God's wisdom. But uh, part of the key of faith is believing and understanding that, that even when what God is calling me to do doesn't uh, makes sense to my fallen reasoning, God knows 
clearly better than I know. Like God sees things as they, they truly are. And if uh, I don't think that seems like the best plan, the problem is not with God and his word, right? The problem is with me. And so uh, the people of Israel, they experience uh, salvation from their enemies through faith. They saw how God had miraculously intervened. They're prepared to do what Joshua told them to do. And, uh, and that means that they did it through faith. Uh, the Israelites experienced salvation from the hands of the Egyptians, and they experienced salvation from the hands of the Canaanites under Joshua. And, and all of that underscores an important idea in, in Scripture. Because uh, notice that the salvation that's described here, uh, the salvation that God brought when he delivered his people from Egypt and the salvation that God brought when he defeated Jericho, uh, both of those are examples of when God brought salvation through judgment, which is to say that God brought judgment upon his enemies. He brought judgment upon Jericho. He brought judgment upon Egypt. And in bringing judgment upon the enemies of his people, he brought salvation to his people. And, and so it's this idea of salvation through judgment and uh, uh, again, it's an important idea in scripture. In fact, it's uh, uh, so important. There's one author who wrote a book, something to the effect of salvation, God's glory and salvation through judgment. I believe it's uh, Hamilton is the author, but he says that that is the very center of all of biblical theology, right? And whether or not you agree with that, it is a very central idea in the Bible. And uh, it's, it's obviously not just isolated to these two examples. Um, if we go back to the book of Genesis, the very first promise of redemption we find in the entire Bible comes in the pronouncement of the curse upon the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. And as God pronounces the curse, he says that he will send one of Eve's offspring, the seed, to come and crush the head of the serpent. And of course, uh, Jesus ultimately fulfills this through his life, death, and resurrection. But, but notice that that salvation is salvation through judgment. It's a salvation that comes through the crushing of the head of the serpent. Uh, similarly, when God saves Noah and his family, it is salvation through judgment. Uh, when uh, God rescues Lot and his daughters, it's salvation through God's judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. In the story of Esther, the Jewish people experience salvation through the judgment that comes upon Haman. And when we come into the New Testament, this, we see this idea uh, really throughout the New Testament. I think particularly, though, of the book of Revelation, because in uh, Revelation, all of the judgments that come upon the world come in response to the prayers of the saints who cry out to God to bring justice upon those who persecuted them. And uh, God's judgment upon Babylon the Great, this uh, fallen world system that exists to uh, persecute the people of God. God's people are to uh, come out of her. And when Babylon falls, heaven rejoices and God's people are delivered. And in that final battle, in the battle of Armageddon, the, the beast and the false prophet and those who come in opposition to Christ are defeated and God's people are delivered. It is salvation through judgment. And uh, the place, of course, where we most clearly see salvation through judgment is in what Christ does on the cross on our behalf. Because when Jesus dies on the cross, he takes upon himself the judgment that should have come upon us because of our sin. And the, the judgment that, that he took was the judgment that we deserve. So it's by his stripes that we are healed. It is salvation through judgment that we experience in Christ. And I think one of the ideas, or one of the reasons this idea is important is because God possesses both justice and mercy. And in the book of Exodus, in Exodus 34, when uh, you'll remember Moses asks God to show him his glory, right? And so uh, God puts Moses in the cleft of the rock and uh, passes before him and in effect allows Moses to, to see his back. And as he passes in front of Moses, the Lord proclaims, uh, the Lord, the Lord, a gracious and merciful, uh, a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. 
right? And so all of that highlights the mercy and the grace of God. But the Lord continues in this self-description as he's passing in front of Moses and he proclaims that he is also the one who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And so when God reveals himself, he reveals himself as both just and merciful. And, you know, it's interesting because in, in some ways, these, these attributes of God might seem contrary to each other. I mean, if God exercises justice, we might think that he actually neglects to be merciful. Uh, because if God uh, executes strict justice, then he gives that person what that person deserves, right? That's, and that's justice. Uh, but mercy is what happens when you don't get what you deserve, right? And so if God extends mercy, then we might think that uh, God doesn't give justice because if God doesn't give you what you deserve, then you don't get the justice that you deserve. And of course, you know, we live in a day where people like the idea that uh, God is a God of mercy. Uh, people are happy to talk about a God of love and a God of grace and a God who exercises patience. And in uh, Christian churches, you know, God's grace and his love and his mercy, uh, those things get a lot of uh, airtime in sermons and in worship songs. And yet what the Bible teaches about God's judgment is uh, less popular in comparison. And in fact, uh, to speak of the coming judgment could, depending on the circles, uh, could put you in the same category as the sort of uh, doomsday prophet shouting about God's judgment on the street corner in some city somewhere. And, um, and so the point is you can't speak of God's mercy and salvation apart from God's judgment. Uh, the two go together. Uh, the idea that God brings salvation through judgment preserves both God's mercy and God's justice. Because when we understand that God brings salvation through judgment, that means that you can't speak of God's mercy and salvation apart from judgment because the salvation that God brings is salvation through judgment. And so, verse 31, finally, the author says, by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. So uh, not only do God's people experience uh, salvation through faith, Rahab the prostitute experiences salvation through faith. And uh, you'll remember how the story, in, in the story of Rahab, in the, as the spies come into the land, they come to the house of this, this prostitute named uh, Rahab, and they're going to lodge there. Uh, when I preached through the book of Joshua, I talked about how some of the, the Jewish commentators and uh, Jewish scholars have attempted to argue that uh, Rahab was merely an innkeeper and not a prostitute. And uh, probably the reason that some of the rabbis and Jewish commentators have attempted to, to wash over the fact that she was a prostitute is because the idea of a Gentile prostitute uh, being shown mercy is actually contrary to their, their theology. It's contrary to their, their doctrine. And, uh, you know, we see this obviously in the way that the Pharisees object when Jesus interacts with sinners and tax collectors and Gentiles and prostitutes. And, uh, and yet when we look at the original Hebrew text, the word that's used is the word prostitute. And uh, likewise, we see the same thing uh, here in the book of Hebrews with the, the Greek word. And so the, the fact that Rahab is a prostitute, uh, it might cause us to think sort of like the, the Jewish commentators that uh, she's an unlikely candidate to be a recipient of God's mercy. Because, you know, we have, she's, a, she's this uh, pagan woman living in a pagan land. And not only is she uh, pagan, but she is also a, a prostitute. And not only is she a pagan prostitute living in a pagan land, she's also living among the enemies of God in the very city upon which God is preparing to execute judgment, right? So you would look at her and you would think that she would be a really good candidate to be a recipient of that judgment because of her, her wicked lifestyle. And so why would she, of all people, receive mercy? 
And the question is, yes, why indeed? And when we reflect upon our own lives, uh, I think we should perhaps ask the same question, right? If uh, we look at ourselves closely and we examine ourselves honestly, we should find that we are no better than her. Because uh, before we came to saving faith in Christ, each one of us was a rebel living in bondage to sin. Uh, we all live in a world which uh, the Lord is yet prepare, upon which the Lord is yet preparing to execute judgment, and uh, yet the Lord delights in the salvation of sinners. Right? Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Or in the words of the Pharisees in Luke 15, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus didn't come to call the righteous, uh, which is really good news, right? Because according to Romans 3, there are none who are righteous. And uh, there isn't one of us who hasn't earned his or her place as an enemy of God. We have all rebelled against God. We've broken his law. We are dark-minded enemies of God with callous hearts who are ignorant and spiritually dead. That's who we are apart from saving faith in Christ. Uh, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. And, uh, and, and so... All of humanity is morally depraved. Every facet of our being has been corrupted by sin with the result that in our fallen state, apart from God's grace, we are incapable of any good. Uh, intellect, emotions, and will have all been corrupted by sin. That's what the Bible teaches about fallen humanity. But the good news of the gospel is that Christ came to rescue fallen people. Uh, Christ came to rescue uh, sinful people. Paul says, for while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And when Christ died on the cross, he died to pay the penalty for the sins of sinful people. He died for pagans and prostitutes. And so if our faith is in Christ, our sins are forgiven and we've been given a right standing before God. And that's all because Jesus is a friend of sinners. Uh, again, we see this in the way that God extends mercy to Rahab. And although she lived this immoral lifestyle, she and she's a, a sinner and a prostitute, she experiences God's mercy through faith. Uh, but we really, all of us, are unlikely candidates to receive God's grace. And although uh, Rahab isn't necessarily the person we would expect to turn and place her faith in Yahweh, uh, none of us are the kind of people that we would expect to turn and place their faith in Yahweh. Uh, that's actually the point, right? Jesus said that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And apart from God's grace, none of us would turn and place our faith in Christ. We are all unlikely converts. But by God's grace, we have received mercy through faith. Uh, Rahab feared the Lord. She accepted what the spies said concerning God's word. And through faith, she escaped God's judgment. Uh, through faith, the Israelites escaped God's judgment when they crossed through on dry ground. And uh, through faith, the people of Israel experienced salvation when the walls of Jericho were brought down. And uh, the same thing is true for us concerning Christ, right? It's only through faith on what, uh, in what Christ did on the cross that we can escape God's judgment and experience salvation. And uh, just like Rahab, we live in a world that is marked for destruction. But through faith in Christ, we can experience God's mercy because Christ has taken the judgment upon himself that we deserved if our faith is in him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of the gospel. We thank you for the way that the gospel is proclaimed in all of the stories in the New Testament. Uh, we thank you that uh, although you are uh, righteous and just, and although in, in, in our own uh, works we deserve your judgment, that you have brought salvation by bringing that judgment upon the one who stood in our place, who died in our place, and who took the wrath that we deserved in our place. Uh, help us as we continue to uh, focus on this truth this morning in the Lord's Supper. We pray that we would be uh, nourished and reminded of the gospel that is proclaimed in the Lord's Supper and that we would walk in greater levels of faithfulness 
and obedience as a result of our encounter with, with your word this morning. And we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.